Okay, now let's. I'm going to start my speech, and thanks, uh, thanks for participating in this speech. I know some of you are in China, and right now it's already very late, and some of you are in Europe. It's already close to the dinner time, but you guys choose to spend your precious time during the weekend to listen to my speech. It's a great honor to me. This speech is about 1987 market crash and the current ETF trading. I have conducted macro-related research for some time, but the ETF is still new to me. There are many areas in the ETF that I'm not still that clear. So in this speech, I will try my best not only to show what I found during my research. But also the problem I encountered and the mistake I made. In order to let you guys have a better understanding of the structure of the speech, I will make a brief introduction of how it will be organized. The first part will be the introduction of 1987 market crash. I will give both the macro background. And the market microstructure. Then, in the second part, I will briefly talk about the 2010 flash crash and how market realized the weakness of the ETF. In the third part, I will talk about the special design of the AP system in the ETF trading, which separates the primary and secondary market. And last. I will use two cases of what kind of mistake I made to show the tax treatment and the misleading creation and redemption signals of the ETF. If there's no questions, let's enter into the first part, the background of the 1987 market crash. So in this slide, it shows the Dow Jones Index during the 1980s. We can see that from the 1982, the market rose all the way up to the 1987, and suddenly it went down almost 30 percent in a very short period of time, and this is what we call the Black Monday. There are several reasons lead to the market crash. Next, I will share the macro background. The first is Reagan tax cut. And the government growing deficit. This topic looks very familiar right now, because if you change Reagan to Trump, that is what the market is talking right now. Before 1985, the U.S. is experiencing strong dollar, as investors believe that the deficit will push up the long-term interest rate. Considering Paul Volcker was still the chairman of the Fed then. The market players also believe that the Fed will not printing money to finance the deficit, nor allow inflation to go up. However, Reagan tax cut turned out to be a failure, and the U.S. government was facing growing pressure from domestic firms because the strong dollar makes them in the weak competitiveness against Japanese firms. So, in the 1985. The financial ministers of several countries, note not the central bankers, gathered at the Plaza Hotel near the Central Park to coordinate the U.S. dollar to depreciate against a basket of currencies, including the Japanese yen, the German mark, the British pound. We know when a country depreciates its currency to adjust the trade balance during the initial period. The current account will worse because the price change will take effect immediately, but the consumer need time to adjust their behavior. What's even worse at that time is the U.S. major trade partner is Japan. If you did some research in Japanese economy, you will know its special Kyushu corporate system. In Chinese, we call it Caifa. Such as Mitsubishi, Mitsu, Sumitomo. In the Kyushu system, there are two tier of companies: the parent companies, such as Toyota, 
and their subcontractors. The parent company has a small number of employees and offer lifelong employment. But for the subcontractors, its treatment to employees are much worse, and the subcontractors are facing constant pressure from their parent firms to cut costs and squeeze profit. As a result, even the yen was appreciating against dollar at that time, the Japan is still experiencing constant sub trade surplus. And this put dollar under even larger pressure and pulled down further to the extent that the U.S. government realized this hurts U.S. interest. So in the 1987, they signed the Louvre Accord to support the U.S. dollar. Another reason for the market crash is the bull market during the past five years due to the expanding consumer and corporate credit. So here is a question. As Fed is not printing money, the U.S. government, the U.S. consumers, the U.S. corporates all increase their spending. So who is financing this? It's turned out to be the Japanese investors. During those years, the Japanese investors rushed to the U.S. market to buy the bond to push down the interest, long-term interest rate and the buying stocks to push up the stock market and using the dollars they earned from their trade. At that time, the local Japanese capital market is highly regulated. The government is controlling the interest rate. There are not many options for the local residents to invest just like what China experienced before the 2008. So at last, the Alan Grasban becomes the new chairman of the Fed on August 1987. I have to say, he, at that time, he hasn't built trust among investors. Those are the macro background. So next, Let's talk about the market microstructure. The Brady report attributes major reasons of the market crash to the dynamic hygiene of portfolio insurance providers. Such method is invented by three Berkeley professors in 1970s, which guided investors to sell futures to hedge their stock holdings to prepare for the market going down. However, the hedge itself will create additional pressure and further press the market. It's like a vicious cycle. So in Schiller's paper, he has argued that this should not be the main reason because the dynamic hedging is only optimized what investors would do when market is going down. It only allows investors to do it more effectively. By selling the futures, the market pressure transmit from the futures market to the equity market as the arbitrators buy the futures and sell the stocks. When, and when they anticipate further hedging from portfolio insurance providers, they even do the front run. The failure of market maker and settlement system also leads to the crash. At that time, the different exchange have their own settlement system and not connect with each other. So when the market crash, the banks cannot make a good judgment of the counterparty risk. So they have to limit the credit to the market makers and this limited the purchasing power from the buyers. However, those are the reasons offered by the government Brady report. If you have watched the famous BBC TV series Ministers, the purpose of the minutes is not to record events. The purpose is to protect people. So I guess the government Brady report is very similar. Okay, I've finished the history part. 
Now let's move on today and see could such market crash happen again. So the first question is: Is there a new form of portfolio insurance provider? The answer is yes. The new form are CTAs. For example, the Man Group AHL, the Systematica, which spin off from Bluecrest, and the Winton Group. And according to Financial Times, the trend followers were were the only hedge fund group that enjoyed healthy inflows in 2016, with a total asset growing to a record 287 billion by the year end. Although their asset under management is not that large, but considering their major tools are futures, which is very highly leveraged. So their marketing impact could be huge. So next, let's see the market microstructure in the 2010 flash crash. On that day, the market experienced maybe the largest intraday move from history. Some researchers use pictures to show the behavior of the market. The green and blue dot represent market makers. The left part of the second picture is during normal times. We can see that they trade with each other, but not that very often. They're mainly dealing with individual investors. But during the flash crash, which shows the red dot map on the right, their connections raise dramatically. And they trade heavily with each other and work together to push down the market. Thanks to the technology and high frequency trading strategies, the market behavior totally changed from 40 years ago. And from 2010 market crash, two thirds of the canceled trade orders are ETF. So next, let's see what is ETF and why it became so popular in the past decade. First, let's check ETF from the legal perspective. Like the mutual fund, ETF are registered under 1940s Investment Act as an open-end fund. Others, mainly the earliest product, are registered at Unit Investment Trust, aka UIT, such as SPY and QQQ. Note. Note here.、Uh, here we only talk about equity and bond ETF, and this is not applies to the commodity ETF. And for the ETF registered as an open end fund or the UIT, there are a big difference between them regarding the stock lending and the dividend reinvestment. For the open end fund, the popular business model, it has flexible operations. It can choose to optimize its holdings instead of rigidly tracking index and hold every single stocks the index track. It can also lend stocks and reinvest the dividend into the ETF. However, the UIT has more limit. It can do what it cannot do. What I just mentioned. So in this slice. We can see the difference between those two structures. This is the trading st statistics of SPY and IVV from Fidelity. Those two ETFs are the most popular ETF track S&P 500 index, but their short interest levels are totally different. The SPY short interest amount to 18 percent, but the IVV only less than one percent. I guess the dividend reinvestment policy plays a huge part in this. So when the market is going to rise, the IVV will reinvest its dividend into the ETF, which makes short cost even higher. On the other hand, SPY just push the cash dividend into a separate account and will not do the reinvestment. So when the market reverts the trend and start going down. 
Maybe we can expect more short interest of IVV than SPY. But I have to say I haven't done in, haven't enough time to do research. It's only a guess. So the next slides. Let's talk about the special structure of the ETF. Unlike mutual fund, investors cannot directly trade with the ETF sponsor, say BlackRock. They trade with each other in the stock market like trading stocks. And for the creation and redemption process, the system create a new setup called authorized participant, aka AP, which are mainly large banks, including the Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, so also large market makers like KCG and Virtual. Those APs trade directly with the ETF sponsor and only in large block trade, ranging from 50,000 to 200,000 shares. Those AP are also market makers and their participate in both primary and secondary market enable ETF shares price to fluctuate in a very small boundaries of the NAV. The mechanism works like this. When the ETF trade at its discount, the AP will buy the ETF and sell the underlying stocks and deliver the ETF to the ETF sponsor to exchange the corresponding stocks. Then the AP can close its short position and make a profit. However, the arbitrage is only in theory. In real market, there is no such easy arbitrage opportunities. According to ICI research, the volume of ETF primary market only accounts 10% of the secondary market trading. And the most likely cases are the APs create the ETF in response to the large institutions, say, in the morning of July the 3rd, a fund approached to Goldman Sachs and asked to buy 100,000 shares of SPY. The liquidity at that time is not that good due to the holiday reasons. So in order to avoid bring huge market impact, the Goldman Sachs will directly create ETF shares by buying underlying stocks instead of trading in the secondary market. And such fees, such profit for the AP is not that high. So, regarding the perfect structure of the ETF, I always thought, is it too good to be true? And I always try to find this weakness in this design. I tried my research from two different approaches. So in this part, I will show you guys what kind of mistakes I made and hope you can learn from it. Also, I have to mention this only applies to the US ETF market. The ETF in Europe and Asia are very different and might not apply to the result. Here is the first mistake I made, overvaluing ETF tax efficiency. I've seen many people talking about the ETF tax efficiency and the first render effect of the mutual fund, but nobody gave a detailed example. So here is the mechanism I imagined which turned out to be wrong. We know trading firms, they have to pay tax on their capital gains. So when a fund accumulates taxable unreal, unrealized capital gains, it's very dangerous for its investors for its shareholders because if the fund has to realize capital gain when it sold shares to meet redemption request, the NV will change. So suppose the fund A has a hundred net asset with ten investors. Each investor owns equal stake. The first investors can redeem the shares at ten bucks. After the fund sold stocks to raise cash, the NAV would decrease 10 plus the tax on the realized capital gains, right? So the second investors would redeem at a price less than 10. So this is like a vicious cycle, especially during the market crash. But the ETF, because it's trans 
because it's in kind trans special in kind transactions. It can protect the remaining shareholders for from the investors who redeem the shares. And I even find this chart: the domestic ETF, the domestic equity mutual fund, and ETF flow. And we see that, especially recently, the domestic mutual fund saw a huge decrease of outflow, and the domestic on. And the ETF saw huge inflows, so I speculate is this the first runner effect drive this. And but unfortunately, I ignored an important tax code. Here it is. The mutual fund serve as a conduit or path through to the mutual fund investors. If it distribute all or substantially. Ninety percent of net investment income to the shareholders. The example is like this: Suppose Max buys a thousand shares of mutual fund on the December twenty ninth for fifteen bucks per share. The next day, the fund makes its annual distribution of next net capital gains and dividend realized for the year, amounting to five per five bucks per share. So this reduces the value of max share by five, but he also has to include five dollar income for the year, and pays tax for it. However, and he can do some transactions to avoid such loss. He can sell the mutual fund immediately and claim five dollars loss, and this will cancel with his five dollars capital gains. So the redemptions of the others of the mutual fund do have externalities, but it only affects when when the remaining shareholder pay pays tax, not the how much. Of course, if you consider the transaction cost and the compound investment, the effect should not ignore, but it should not that important. But for the ETF, in theory, it can leverage in-kind transactions and turn itself into a closed-end fund. Here is how it works. We know there are different kinds of stocks in ETF stock pools, which cost basis are different, because before the AP make the redemption, It only knows what kind of stocks it can receive from the ETF sponsors, but the historical detail price are unknown, and deliver what kind of shares to the AP is the decision that the ETF PM made. And also, the APs they are not mutual fund; they cannot pass the capital gain through. So different stocks make a huge difference. For example, the Apple price right now is trading 100 bucks. So when AP receive the Apple price with 100 dollars cost basis, it doesn't pay any tax. But when the received stock cost basis are 50, even though it, the AP made 0.5 bucks profit for arbitrage. It has to pay tax capital gains for the fifty bucks if it receive the Apple shares, which cost basis at one hundred fifty. It can receive fifty dollars tax credit. So, in order to prevent redemptions and keep the AUM, in theory, the AETF sponsors can pick low cost basis stocks. A lower APs incentive to redeem. When that happens, the ETF will experience discount and will treat like the closed end fund. If we review the history of 1940 Investment Act, we know that such things is not that unimaginable. At that time, we saw very strange phenomenon that the fund industry are pushing. For the strict self-regulations, the scholars are trying to figure out why 
and attribute this to the protecting their shared branding. Before 1929, the clothes and font enjoyed average 50% premium, but after 1929, it experienced 30% discount. The industri industry expert expect such discount to disappear very soon, but it's turned out not true. Right now, we still experience some discount for trading the clothes and found. And one issue they found is that a few number of clothes and found perform poorly and destroy the sector's branding. So consider for the ETF, consider, consider there's no rules that regulate ETF price to be within a certain limit of their net asset value. So this thing could happen to ETF. But in the US, it's not that likely. Why well, take a second thought? Because the large players dominate the market and they care about their long term development. For the EDF in other reasons, other countries, it could happen. But as I mentioned, I haven't done, haven't enough time to do that research and do not know the details. So this is the first mistake I made. And next, I will talk about the misleading of signals of ETF creation and redemption shares. A like mutual fund which create which creation represent capital inflow, which indicates maybe price increase in the future, the special mechanism of ETF make creation and redemption shares pretty misleading. Here is the stock price chart and shares outstanding of the SPY. We can see and the orange chart, orange line shows the price chart, the index price chart, and the white bar shows the shares outstanding of the SPY. We can see that the shares outstanding of the SPY increased when the market price fell during the 2008 financial crisis. The short selling demand drives the creation of the SPY because those APs they also have prime brokerage desk. So when they face facing growing demand of short selling of SPY, they increase and the increasing borrow rate, borrow rate those APs can purchase underlying stocks, create them into SPY, and sell futures to hedge its positions. So that is why we saw this strange situation that the numbers of outstanding of the SPY increased, but the market going down. The SPY is only a simple physical ETF. And here I will introduce Another model of ETF, the synthetic model of ETF, is not popular in the US, but it is used to be the dominant player in the Europe. Instead of directly holding shares, the ETF sponsor will sign a total return swap with a counterparty, and the counterparty usually is the trading desk of the ETF sponsor. And this can increase the profit of the bank. Although there are no tracking errors, but the investors are facing huge counterparty risk. So right now, the European investors also shift their habit from the synthetic ETF to the physical ETF. And in the US, most leverage or inverse ETF adopt, adopt such business model. And here is the daily holding of the ProShares SDS, which offers double reverse daily return of the SP500. For the leveraged ETF, it's very dangerous for investors who seek long-term result. And here is the daily and long-term performance as DUG and DIG, which also offers three times 
and minus three times daily return of the oil index. We can see that for the intraday traction, they perform pretty well, but in the long term, both went down. And the mystery of this is their daily rebalancing issue. Because the product trades daily return, tracks daily return, so it has to rebalance before the bell close. So when the market rise, it will increase its exposure. When the market going down, it will decrease its exposure. Here is a screenshot from Barclay Global Investors, now the BlackRock paper by Ming De Cheng. And we can read it for real quick. So, because the leverage ETF has to rebalance as late as possible to track the daily return, so the brokerage firms are offering such information in order to let investors do a legal front run. And here is an example of the message the brokerage firm sent to their clients. Remember the misleading signal of the SPY during the 08 crisis, right? So I picked four leverage fund there and checked their share, shares outstanding from the September the 12th, 08, which is three days before Lehman Brothers fell bankruptcy to the August the 10th. And the market went down 30% almost during those days. And we can see that, and those shares, those ETF are SSO, which lever which offers double return, double daily return for the SP500, SDS, the miners double daily return, the SPY and SH, which offers miners return of the SP500. And we can see that the SDIS, despite, despite its good performance, experienced decreasing shares outstanding. On the contrary, the SSO, which tracks double daily return of SP500, even though its price went down further and further, its shares outstanding skyrocketing. The only explanation for this, I guess, is the demand of short selling. As for the SSO and SDS, they are the two largest leverage ETF 
which tracks the SP 500. So I check their shares outstanding in the longer time horizon. And here is the interesting chart. The SSO, which tracks the double daily return, is shares outstanding picked at March the 4th, 2009. On that day, the SP 500 reached its historical low price and then recovering. At the same time, shares of SSO start a free fall. On the other hand, the SDS, its shares of the standing slightly decreased during the crisis, but continued to grow all the way during the past five years. And when you check online, you can see many people talk about the strategy of shorting the leverage ETF to claim the time delay decay. Here is the chart of short SDS versus long SPY from 08 to 14. The returns are pretty good. However, very few investors were using the leverage ETF. From 13F, we know that the largest shareholder of SSO right now is Goldman Sachs. But it's only take a 1.6% stake. And the largest shareholder of SDS is Medital Group, a mid-sized hedge fund, with only 1.14% stake. Some fund, very, very few funds trade derivative on the leverage ETF, but this is not popular. And here, and this is an example of Guess the Reuters, and this fund record 40% return on, I guess, 2018. And one of the weather suggests that the many ETF sponsors prohibit short selling of leverage ETF by institutional investors. So considering so we can say that right now, mainly the individual investors are the major player of the leverage ETF. But considering the high cost of the holding the, holding the leverage ETF, I guess its borrow rate must be very high. So the next chart is something that I feel very confused and cannot explain. We know that Individual investors are major shareholders. But the short interest of SDS and SO is also very small. For the SDS, its short interest is only 6.4%, but for the SSO, its short interest is only 5.2%. And we know that institutional investors, they are not Sell, short selling SO and SDS heavily. So they are just wholesome. But the individual investors, in theory, this should be a trend follower, right? And they should hold more SSO than SDS, right? And I think about it, and one possible explanation that I can imagine is that individual investors try to hold SDS as a hedge. But SSO, as it offers double return of this index, is not that helpful in the bull market. This makes some sense, but not perfect. And okay, and that is the main part of my speech. And here is the recommend reading materials I've read. And the first is the book Lobbying America. It's talked about how U.S. politics and business like negotiate with each other and push change the U.S. economy. In Chapter Seven, A Tale of Two Tax Cut, talk focusing on the Reagan tax cut. And the next book is International Monetary Corporations. It's talk about the 1985 Plaza Accord. In the Chapter 7, the Plaza Accord and Japan, written by Takatoshi Ito, it gives offers very detailed 
operation of the Japanese government intervention in the foreign exchange at that time. And by the way, the professor Takatoshi Ito, he was on the very short list of Abe's Abe's choice of the BOG governor, but he wasn't picked up. Right now, he was a full-time professor at Columbia CIPA, and I believe he is the most senior people who understand the Japan economy in the U.S. And the third book is the weight of the yen. And in the chapter five, the weak claims it talks about the Japanese inflow into the U.S. capital market. And the last book, The Princess of the Yen, written by Richard Weiner. The winner was a chief economist of the Fleming Securities in Hong Kong at that time, and covered Asia. And in this book, it offers a totally different explanation of Japan's economy bubble and how it collapsed. And here are the recommended reading materials on the ETF. The first one is Ming De Cheng, the dynamic of leverage ETF. If by the way, the Ming De Cheng, he was a、uh, head of research of BlackRock, and right now he's the chairman of the ITG, and he graduates from National Taiwan Universities. Okay,、uh, I only conducted research on ETF for two months and still not fully understand it, so I plan to do. More research on it of the next half year, and hope to give another speech in the future. So, if you are interested in doing the research together or has career opportunities, I'm very glad to discuss. And here is my contact info. So, at last, I want to thank Lin, Bo, and Anchi for organizing this speech, and thanks Yue, Jason, Shi Xiang, Hua Sheng. Jincheng for helping me to do the research preparations, and special thanks to Eugene, William, Gang, and Guanghua to act as an advisor and offer valuable comments, and of course Chen Juan for organizing the whole event and make things happen. Finally, thanks everyone for attending this event and listen to my speech. Thank you. Muted，哦，或者是。呃，或者可以把问题放在贴贴在群里面，也可以，也可以提出。我可以就是帮助提在在会议里面提出来。然后，如果大家有问题的话，可以把自己 unmute 掉。有问题吗？就是、大家可以把问题贴在群里面，谢谢。嗯 ，OK， 呃，现在有一个问题给演讲者，就是校长提出来，他的问题是 ，What's the performance of CTA in 2016 and uh and 2008? And for the performance of CTA in 2008, what I've read is it performs. Okay. Unmuted. Okay, sorry. And for the performance of the CTA in 2008, the material I've read is they perform very well. But in the 2017, I haven't read that material yet. So I will dig deeper and talk to you, like Chen Juan at a later time. Okay. Um. Here's another question here about the CTA. Is the CTA performance very good in 2007? Can you give some comment? 
Uh, uh, sorry, I haven't done that research yet, and honestly speaking, I'm not that clear. Okay. Um, here's another question here. Um, the ETF uh, is there any arbitrage opportunity between ETF and uh, some like a larger constituents? Uh. In theory, yes, but for the experience, I talked to my friend who work at a ETF, an AP desk. Um, there is very few such opportunities because the market is so efficient. So right now, their profit margin is very small. Maybe the Citadel, their because their count is cooperating. Ha Closely with their APs, so they might have, but I'm not sure. I haven't talked to anybody at Citadel. Okay. Yeah, here's another question here about the, um, the portfolio insurance. Uh, could you give me some comments about the portfolio insurance and the risk priority? Uh, risk priority, sorry. Uh, I'm not that clear. I think I have to do the research and give the Shen feedback at a later time. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, here's another question here. Um, why is SPY the most popular SP500 index ETF? Or uh, is it the most popular one? If so, why? Uh, it is the most popular one because it is the first ETF in history and created by the State Street. So because of the first mover advantage, so it attracts the most largest and becomes the most popular ETF. Even though its expense ratio is a little bit higher than the IVV, it still attracts in capital inflow from investor. Okay. <clears throat> um, I have another question here about the the in, uh, how does the index affect the ETF, or if if it's so, how? If not, maybe you can give some comment. Okay. Any stock index or any market index. Okay. What I have read is like for the ETF tracks index, and because some index they will. They have different date uh, of announcement and make the real change. So during the, the, that period of time, some investors can do the front run and trying to hammer the ETF. So, but the ETF they don't care, right? Because they only care about what they is their tracking performance good or bad. So some companies are aware of that and trying to shift their tracking index. Like I remembered. That one material I read that some companies change from SP related index to the Russells, which they they make change adjustment immediately after their announcement. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, here's an, a one question here about how does the how does the speculator play in the during the ETF trading? Or what's the role of the could you give some comment? Speculator. Speculator. Uh, sorry, I still relatively new to the ETF, and I only doing the research on its mechanism and hasn't reached to the impact of speculator yet. So in the next six months, it's a great topic that worth. Digging deeper, so I I think I can f give feedback at a later time. Okay, sure. thank you. Um, here's a, um, one question here. Have you ever considered about ETFs re related to the VIX, like VXX or mm -hmm. TVR TVIX, as another comparable? Um, the question. And he he guessed that there are some. There are also very they are very related to SPY. Uh. I think so, because from the paper I read, the VIX index also highly correlated to the SPY creation, because when the market start feeling panic and people are going to short the SPY, which increased the creation of the SPY. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh-huh. Um, here's another question here. Can, can you elaborate on cost basis one buy or sell stocks in ETF for, for example, like uh, Apple stock? Okay, and here's the example. Suppose, for example, the SPY, uh, it established from 1997. So from the beginning, it's continue to like receive cap and flow and the AP continue to deliver and stocks during different period of time. So for the ETF sponsors, it will record it the historical cost price of any single shares. So when the AP redeem and the tax effect of giving AP what kind of like shares will bring huge tax difference. So, and the example is what I talked in the speech. If the current trading price is 100 and the ETF sponsor gives them cost basis 5 bucks, it's work like the AP itself gets the Apple price at 50, but it sells at 100. So legally, the AP owns the share, the low cost based shares, and if it sells, it will trigger the tax, and it has to pay the tax. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, here's another question. Um, could you please compare shorting SPY and buying bearish SP ETF? Uh, I haven't done that yet, but I think it uh, will lose a lot of money. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you have any questions? Can you put the questions in the group? Um, okay, I think um, we, I think I think uh, almost done. Okay, thank so thank you everybody. Um, I think uh, the the conference is, is it. Okay, so uh, let's let's thank our speaker Nikun again. And uh, okay, so um, uh, everybody have a, a good, good weekend. Thank you. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.